Welcome to La Marina Arts Council's Art Embraces Words. My name is Denise Gamora and I'm the president of the La Marina Arts Council and we're thrilled to have you all here today for our virtual event. Thank you so much to the attendees and to the writers and the artists who are with us here today. And especially I'd like to thank the Lafayette Community Foundation who helped make this event possible. I'd also like to tell you a little bit about the La Miranda Arts Council. We are a nonprofit organization of volunteers with a mission to ignite and sustain artistic appreciation of all, for all ages throughout La Miranda. And currently we have over 10 active programs and our creative board members have pivoted quickly from face-to-face -face events to virtual programs. And I would also like to tell you on that note that Art Embraces Words will be coming to you two more times before the end of the year. So please do check all the dates and the times on our website, which is lamarindaarts.org. And now I'm thrilled to start our virtual Art Embraces Words. The brainchild of Elena Olaski and Natalie Wheeler, Art Embraces Words brings together the written word and the art world. And writers paint images with words, artists tell stories with color, and together they enrich our community. And now to our first speaker. Nancy Clare of Sherman Oaks has been a journalist and writer her entire career which includes 11 years as an editor at Los Angeles Magazine. Um, today, Nancy will read the introduction to her book, The Battle for Beverly Hills, A City's Independence and the Birthplace of Celebrity Politics. It is a story of the 1923 attempted annexation of Beverly Hills by Los Angeles and its unintended consequence of giving birth to celebrity politics. And now, Nancy. Uh, thank you. I want to make sure everybody can hear me. This is the book. Months following the proposed annexation of Beverly Hills to Los Angeles in early 1923, the sometimes heated rhetoric between those against joining the bigger city, which included some of the world's most famous faces from the new medium of the moving pictures, Mary Pickford, Douglas Fairbanks, Tom Mix, Harold Lloyd, Rudolph Valentino, Will Rogers, Conrad Nagel and Fred Niblo, and those in favor had been a war of words. That is until the morning of February 26th, 1923, when an infernal machine, as the bomb was called in the newspapers, exploded in the hands of Al Murphy, the editor of the Beverly Hills News, the city's weekly paper. Mr. Murphy and the publication, which he owned as well as edited, were pro-annexation, as were many of the real estate developers, including many of the principals of the Rodeo Land and Water Company, which had created Beverly Hills at the turn of the 20th century. If there was one thing that could capture the immediate attention of the residents of Los Angeles, it was a bomb. In LA, especially since the 1910 bombing of the Los Angeles Times, explosive devices at newspapers caught everybody's attention. The attack was covered extensively in the local papers, and the story was picked up by publications across the country, bringing attention to what had been a mundane political interaction between two cities at the western edge of the United States. The battle for Beverly Hills had turned ugly. It's reasonable to assume that most of the people in the Los Angeles area followed the news of the bombing, and some of it, especially from William Randolph Hearst's Los Angeles Examiner, Examiner, was breathless. Must have been asking themselves, why on earth would this suggestion of joining the city of Los Angeles spark such violent outrage? Beverly Hills was remote and geographically tiny with a population of less than a thousand. It had only been incorporated as a city for nine years. Communities across the Southern California basin unincorporated areas as well as incorporated cities had voted to join Los Angeles, especially after the completion of the Los Angeles Aqueduct, the wonder of engineering completed in 1913 by William Mulholland that brought water from the eastern slope of the Sierra Nevada mountains through the Owens Valley. What made Beverly Hills so different? 
and what unique set of circumstances led to its ability to resist the lure of Los Angeles and its abundant water. Well, for one thing, Beverly Hills was the city that Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks called home. In the wake of the undisputed king and queen of motion pictures moving to the small city on the western edge of Los Angeles, many other famous faces, Charlie Chaplin, Tom Mix, and Will Rogers among them, had followed. The stars had their reasons for wanting to live in Beverly Hills, some of which were obvious, like the smaller police force, separate from the Los Angeles Police Department, an important distinction in the era of prohibition. But it wasn't all about seclusion and the privacy to drink cocktails and throw the occasional orgy, although that was part of it. There were also subtle, subtler reasons, such as property values and community control. The star's work against annexation may all seem like a bit of a lark now. And in retrospect, these eight silent screen stars who struck poses and emoted for the hand-cranked cameras come off as quaint. They were anything but. They were the first generation of movie stars and the world had not known anything like them before. They wielded power not because they had been born to it or earned the money to buy it. Their power came from the connection their audience developed with them while sitting in the darkened auditoriums watching flickers. In fact, the timing for the battle with Beverly Hills was prophetic. When the, when the Beverly Hills Eight, led by Mary Pickford, fought annexation, they were doing something that had never been done before. What they did was so successful that it became a model for generations of celebrities to intervene in political causes that caught their fancy or in which they had a vested interest. And over the decades, people paid attention. It is now so much a part of the American political landscape that it's startling to realize that 100 years ago, before the emergence of movie stars, this cause and candidate promotion by celebrities did not exist. And whether or not they realized the long-term consequences of using their high profiles to influence an election's outcome, it dawned on the celebrities who fought the battle for Beverly Hills against the land developers and realtors that there was a shift in how they were perceived and the influence they could bring, and they are going to capitalize on it. How and why did their campaign work? The changing times were a factor. The Roaring Twenties was an era of unprecedented turmoil, both cultural and political. On the one hand, women had finally been given the right to vote. On the other, the Volstead Act, prohibiting the consumption of alcoholic beverages, had passed. Immigrants were pouring into the country. The inexorable population shift from rural to urban that had started before the turn of the 20th century was accelerating. As the robber barons who had capitalized on the country's growing economy after the Civil War began to lose their iron hold on commerce and a new generation of business tycoons emerged, the stifling propriety that had gripped social conventions also began to give way. In the two decades leading up to the Roaring Twenties, political upheaval had raged across the globe. The old order had been wrenched, often by extremely violent means, so as to be unrecognizable. The war to end all wars, as World War I has called, had changed the face of Europe. On Europe's eastern edge, the Russian Revolution had sent shockwaves through every democratic government in the world. On the western side of Europe, the Republic of Ireland had emerged from the bombs, bullets, of the Irish Revolution, splitting the island and thwarting the English who had controlled the whole of Ireland for almost a thousand years. For, un for the United States, World War I had thrown it, especially the soldiers who had traveled to Europe into the world. There was no goal. All right, that's, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so fascinating. Um, I just want to re remind the audience first, make sure that you type in your questions at the Q&A box at the bottom. Um, and I wanted to ask you, Nancy, I'm a little curious. Are you from Beverly Hills? Nope. Nope. <laughs> I'm from, I, I've, grown, I've lived most of my life in Los Angeles, but not uh, Beverly Hills. But I found the story absolutely fascinating. 
Yeah, it is. Absolutely. Especially when you consider the evolution of how celebrities have had an impact, you know, on our politics, like we see a lot of that today, especially the last couple of weeks. Um, Did any celebrities actually help you uh, with any of the anecdotes in your book? Did you reach out to anyone? I I reached out to the descendants of some of the uh, celebrities that were involved, but most of them have sort of gone into the great beyond. Uh, I did speak to uh, one woman who is the uh, scholar in residence at the Mary Pickford Foundation, was very helpful in talking about Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks. And you have to remember that that Douglas Fairbanks Fairbanks and Mary Pickford um, established uh, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, you know, the Oscars. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mary Pickford uh, also established... uh, the, God, I think it's, it's like the Artists Fund, essentially for actors. Uh, it's, a, it's a charity for actors, and it was based on, on the work she did in World War I. Oh, wow. she, she, she really got it. She really got the kind of influence that uh, celebrities can wield. And uh, mm-hmm. I, like, I, I often, I've, I've wondered about this a lot. I started writing the book in 2015. Um, I have often wondered if they hadn't been successful, what the evolution of celebrities and politics would have been. Yes, very true. Um, We are getting a question from an audience member. Are you writing about current times, she's asking? So I think you can answer that easily. Um, No, this is, this. I've been asked that question before. This book essentially a- ends on uh, April 23rd, 1923, which was the date of the vote. Uh, they voted down annexation. They were the only community to vote against annexation to Los Angeles. Right. Um, and that's, that's really where it ends. This, this, obviously the story continues and the story of celebrities and politics was actually started a lot sooner than you might think. Uh, Helen Gahagan Douglas was a senator from California. She was married to Melvin Douglas, who was a popular uh, actor at the time. And she started her political career in the early 30s. Interesting, yeah. Okay, good. All right, and that question was from Helen Ann. I just want to mention her name. Um, I want to also ask you for anyone who's watching that might be uh, starting to write or in the process, Um, As uh, someone who has published a book, I wanted to ask you uh, about finding an agent and a publisher. Is there any advice you could give to emerging writers? Well, I had so much luck with this. I, I, I will tell you some of the methodology I used, which was to look at books of similar subjects. So in my case, I looked at Les Standiford's Water to the Angels, and I looked at uh, uh, Cadillac Desert and books about a similar topic. There are no other books about the topic I wrote on. And I, in the acknowledgments, they'll talk about who their agent is. And um, that's a great place to start because you know that that agent and agents in that agent's agency are familiar with who... Uh, you know, who was, who at the publishing side will be interested in this subject. In my case, I wrote to the agent of Les Standiford and I said, uh, I had a, this idea, you know, I, I, there is an advantage to having been an editor in chief. I've gotten a lot of pitch letters and by day I know what appeals to me in a pitch and that's pretty much how I wrote my pitch. Uh, and it was like the, the first line was, you know, imagine if celebrity politics had never been invented. Sure. And have you ever thought about what started it? And, and that, that's the only, that's the only agent yeah. I had to pitch. Well, I got a call 20 minutes after I pushed the send button. That has not happened to me since with other things I've written. It will probably never happen to me again. Yeah. Um, but I think the, the most important thing a writer who has an idea uh, and is looking for an agent is is to go to someone who is familiar with the subject matter. In the case of a nonfiction book, 
you're going to have to write a proposal. And a proposal, I mean, my book was, I think, 75,000 words, and my proposal was close to 30. So you've essentially written the book. Right. Um, I didn't go really deep into it because each agent is, has his or her methodology for a proposal. And I'm kind of bratty. I didn't feel like rewriting. Okay. But at okay. the same time, I did, I did put together a proposal. Uh, my initial proposal was maybe 15,000 words. Oh, that's very um, Nice. Yeah. And, and it's got to be good. And you've, and little, just little things like I have a strangely spelled name, in spite of it sounding very common, make sure you spell the person's name right. Because most agents get so many uh, queries that if you don't do the due diligence to spell their name right, and if it sounds like a very minor thing, it's not. Right. I totally understand. Yeah. Very good advice, Nancy. Very, very good advice. Thank you so much. And I want to mention that her book is available on Amazon. Can you hold it up for us one more time? It is Gladly. available on amazon.com. And you can also find more about her work on her website, which is Nancy Claire, spelled N-A-N-C-I-E, Claire, C-L-A-R-E.com. All right. Thank you. And next, we have the pleasure of introducing our first artist. We have Donna Marie Argenbright of Lafayette. She taught art to youth ages K through 12 and retired from the Mount Diablo School District. She is currently the president and gallery director of the Moraga Art Gallery. If you haven't had a chance to swing by, it is a lovely, really nice gallery in Moraga. The La Marina Arts Council applauds your dedication, uh, Donna Marie, in promoting local artists for many years at the Moraga Art Gallery. And her work can also be seen, her own work can be seen on the La Marina Arts Alliance website under artists. And so Donna Marie, if you would like to take it away. Thank you very much. So am I, am I on? You are. So, um, uh, my love of clay started in college with a pottery course. Um, our curriculum included all of the arts, which was, which was really great because I found that I liked working in clay and I liked working in three-dimensional arts. And as Denise mentioned, um, I worked, uh, taught art from to K through 12, pre-K through 12 for most of uh, my career. And I always included a unit in clay, which the children did always loved. And since retiring, I have been able to immerse myself, as she mentioned, with the Marga Art Gallery. I'm actually the gallery manager. It's a cooperative, so we all have a lot of jobs. There's the gallery manager, the president, the curators, and so forth. So it's been a lot of fun to be a part of that and a nice place to be able to show and sell my work. Um, so let's see, this piece here are Penguins, Remembrances of South America. And I had the opportunity several years ago to take a cruise down the coast of Chile and back up the coast of Argentina with a stop in the Falkland Islands. So of course I saw many penguins along the way. And when I got home, I thought, well, I wonder if I could make one of those little guys. So this is what I came up with. And it can be a standalone sculpture, it can be a vase, or it can be a creamer or whatever you want to use it for. I always like to make work that people can use. Uh, it just thrills me when someone says, I just picked flowers from my garden and I put them in your vase, or I used um, my morning cup of coffee in your mug. So I'm, I'm just thrilled when people take my pieces home and use them. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So these are, um, okay, these are my attitude figures and actually my customers gave them that name because they're little guys with their hands on their hips and uh, they have a definite attitude to them. Um, they're made with both extrud extruding and throwing on the wheel. An extruder, if you remember the little Play-Doh extruders that your kids may have had where you put the clay in and it came out in the shape of a star or different kinds of stars, that's basically what an extruder is, of course, on an industrial scale. And then the tops of these are thrown. Um, but I make these in all different colors and um, uh, maybe when you'll see a couple more behind me shortly here. 
and uh, they're, they're very popular with my customers. And again, they can be a vase or they can just be a standalone um, piece. So they're, they're fun to make and I try to make each one different and a little whimsical. Okay, so we can go to the next one. And these are my baskets. Um, I like to show the fluidity of the clay and the glazes. I love to have the glazes run. I love to show the plasticity of the clay. So I have these handles that are twisted and, and put on the baskets. Um, my clay is all porcelain, so it's a very white clay and it shows the um, different glaze colors up very well. I tried using a different color of clay one time and I found that it made my glazes look totally different, so I just stayed with the white clay. Um, and I feel very fortunate to have had the opportunity to be working in clay. Um, if we can go to... Um, the full slide, I wanted to share a piece that's a raw clay and then the finished one behind me. I thought people might be interested, you may be familiar, but um, I brought, this is something that, um, see, I'm not seeing myself full screen, so I guess I can see it. So this is the raw clay. It's a piece that I just made. It's an olive hors d'oeuvre dish. And then when it is fired, it's fired once, which is called a bist firing. And so it's hard and you can handle it. And the clay is very white like that. And then this piece is a finished piece, which is glay, um, glazed. And they're fired to it's a mid-range temperature, about 2200 degrees Fahrenheit. And then this is another one, a series that I've been making with, this is the clay, it's, it's uh, hand-built and it's dried. And then the finished piece, well, there's any number of glazes that I use, you can see them behind me. And that particular one is built a lot in the style of this one. So um, I love color. Um, I always, when I taught, I always used a lot of color and I use a lot of color in my glazes also. So I feel fortunate to have the opportunity to work in clay. Um, the magic of opening the kiln after when they have a glaze firing is like Christmas several times a year. You open the kiln and you always hope everything's going to work out and you never quite know until you pull them out of the kiln. So it's like opening presents several times a year. I have found the La Mirinda area offers many opportunities to artists and that the people here are very supportive of the, of the art. So I don't know if there's any particular questions. You know, I just wanted to let you know, Donna Marie, that one of our audience members just said that your penguins were adorable. So just so I wanted to oh, okay. relay Thank that you. message to you from Thank Natasha you. Middleton. Um, your ceramics are are lovely, and we can also find these at the uh, Moraga Art Gallery. Is that possible? Yes. Uh -huh. yes, we're open on Saturday and Sunday noon to three. We are open. We do have reduced hours, but we are open Saturday and Sunday noon to three. Uh-huh. Very good. And then I also wanted to ask you some questions. Um, how is it that if you're you were an art teacher and you taught all different genres of art, how did you get interested in pottery specifically? Well, when I started teaching, I felt that as an art teacher, I should have my own professional medium. And so I went to Aeromont in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, which, uh, and I took a week long class. And in the morning I uh, took weaving and the afternoon I took pottery. And um, I loved both, but the potters weren't afraid to get their hands down and dirty. And, and um, I just had a lot of fun with the potter. So I decided to specialize in, in uh, the pottery. and. Um, my first uh, studio was uh, a big front hall closet in my apartment, which I lined with paper and put the wheel in there. And then I took my pottery down the street to a friend's house to um, fire it there. Wow. And that, <laughs> so after that, my, it actually was a very functional pottery. It was fairly big closet, so it, it worked well. Wow, uh, very, very cool. Yeah. Um, and what about your uh, porcelain pottery or porcelain poetry series? Um, well, there, um, uh, one of the uh, our publicists for the gallery wrote that, and he, he is a beautiful, he's an Eng former English teacher, and um, he wrote that about my work, that my pottery looked like poetry. So it's behind me here, and I guess all these, this is another one of my blue figures, uh, attitude figures, and I work in reds and turquoise and uh, white and uh, beige, so. I guess uh, he found my po my pottery to be uh, poetic, so he he was kind and wrote those gracious words. <laughs> That's awesome. 
Oh, we have a, a few audience members that just want you to know that they love the whimsiness of your art. Thank you, Sandy okay. Fritz. And that Nanette Rundle Carroll also says that your art is very whimsical and it's beautiful. And um, yes, so there you go. Uh, just answer those. And thank you so much. And I hope everybody will go to um, the Moraga Art Gallery and see her work. And of course, I should also mention that everything you're seeing here today is for sale. Um, I believe most of it is for sale. And if you have a question about that, you can always reach out to us at lamarindaarts.org uh, about a specific artist or even an author and just ask us and we will get you the correct information that you need. All right. Okay, thank you. We keep getting lots of questions. lamarindaarts.org is the address. All right, excellent. And next uh, we have the pleasure of introducing Alfred G. Garotto of Concord, who will read from Bishop Muriel in his own words, his recently published Les Miserables related novel. Welcome, Alfred. Can you first start by giving us a little bit of the premise of the, of the book before you begin? Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Most people who have only seen Les Miserables in movies, or on TV, or on stage, do not know that Victor Hugo devoted the first 90 pages of his novel to the life of Bishop Muriel. In telling the bishop's story, Hugo reveals that Muriel intended to write a book. Hugo even provides a detailed outline of that book, along with the fact that the bishop never got to finish it. That's where I step in. In my novel, <laughs> Bishop Muriel, in his own words, um, I take the liberty of channeling the bishop and writing his book as he might have, that is, in, in his own words. I'd like to begin by paying poetic homage to Victor Hugo. I devour your work, study your life, search your soul and mine. Whence your gift to pen a gospel, peer into the soul of good and evil, Divine One steps forward, confessing shyly, blame me. Let me share with you a quote from Les Miserables. Fantine, Book the First, Chapter One, Monsignor Muriel, An Upright Man. Muriel's sister, Baptistine, had never been pretty. Her whole life, which had been a succession of pious works, had produced upon her a kind of transparent whiteness. And in growing old, she had acquired what may be called the beauty of goodness. I begin my novel with the first chapter, The Beauty of Goodness. I am compelled by grace to explore a phenomenon that I have observed with awe over the course of my lifetime. We Frenchmen are obsessed with appearance, with beauty. The ancient Greeks were as consumed with appearance as upper-class culture is today. Yet the Greeks had the insight to peg the root of beauty to a koine word meaning being one's hour. An interesting linkage, to be sure. Beauty, then, knows what time it is or better perhaps, 
knowing who I am and who I am not. My personal mandate as a human then is to know my true relationship with every person I encounter at each stage of my journey and all the individual days that comprise that journey. I offer my dear sister Baptistine as a model of virtuous living. The call to recognize the beauty of goodness, however, applies not only to those who have a lifelong resume of virtue. I have witnessed beauty's goodness at life's earliest stages. A toddler knows no other way of being than in the moment, even as the child grows and changes from week to week. A mother holding her child in her arms searches beyond that moment for hints of the emerging man or woman in their maturity. I suspect that within every parent there resides an unspoken awareness that they may not live to see their children fulfill their God-given destiny. I have witnessed the beauty of goodness in teenage years when it easily suffers displacement along the meandering path to maturity. I pay attention when I hear of any child, teenager, or young adult taken too soon by illness or tragedy. Also, when I hear of young soldiers sacrificing their precious lives on the desecrated altars of their elders self-serving wars. Parents and friends remark, he was such a fine young man, always ready to assist someone. Or, he was too good for this world. My heart cries, no, no. The world needs such young, idealistic men to stay alive, to make their mark on our shattered society. Some of us live our way into beauty. Others suffer their way to it. I think of patients I have known in our neighboring hospital whose clear eyes glow with inner light. The beauty of goodness is like that hidden treasure Jesus spoke of in Matthew 13, 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. The one who finds it buries it again. So happy is he that he goes and sells everything he has in order to buy that field. When I discover goodness, be it for a moment or longer, I rejoice in its native beauty and bask in its bright light. So inspired, I take quill pen in hand. I lay no claim on earth or before God to any poetic aptitude. At these times, when I hear the call, I should say, challenge of the muse, I dare to express my heart in the fewest possible syllables. In doing so, I take comfort in knowing that no other eyes will see and, God forbid, judge my verse. The beauty of goodness. I see goodness in a mother's smile, a helping hand, a loving heart. I find goodness in a kind word, a 
silent shrine. Sunrise aglow. Chancing upon the beauty of goodness, I catch my breath, stand in awe. Thank you very much for listening. That was lovely. That was really nice. Um, I, I got a, a, a question. Um, and it, it actually, I think they quoted Hugo, Victor Hugo, who was a lover, uh, or um, I want to ask you, um, he, he wrote, music expresses that which cannot be put into words and that which cannot remain silent. And to your knowledge, was Victor Hugo then a lover of music? Victor Hugo was a lover of music, of poetry, of prose, um, think of the, the fine arts. And uh, he really tells this story of Les Miserables as a parable. Uh. Well, usually you think of Victor Hugo as an atheist, uh, a man who had no religion, no God, and all of that was fairly true except that he re reveals himself at times in the book, the whole 1,200 pages of Les Miserables. He keeps throwing in these little asides about himself. And in, in a number of them, he really talks about how he grappled with God and what the result was. And uh, so he's, it's hard to say Victor Hugo was anything because he was so many things. So many things, correct? Yeah, okay. Um, in, in your book, you speak of goodness as being a form of beauty. And how can you elaborate that just a little bit more? I guess the best way I think about it is that uh, I'm talking about an inner beauty as okay. opposed simply to how handsome or beautiful a movie star is or some spectacular kind of beauty. I'm looking at inner beauty, and I think that comes through in this chapter where uh, Bishop Muriel, if he says, I see goodness, he's really saying, I see beauty. Sure. In a child's smile, in a teenager's struggle to get through. And, and how about you, in light of everything that's going on, the pandemic, everything, can you see examples of beauty and goodness around us with what's going on? I really do. Uh, I think I mean, <laughs> simply going outside and seeing people wearing masks and gloves and keeping socially different is a beautiful thing. Sure. It's a kind of beauty. Mm -hmm. that we care about each other. Yeah, and maybe the first responders even, and, right. the, and just, yeah, just ordinary citizens. Um, great, we, we got a note from an attend, uh, someone who's watching, Linda Hartman says, Al, that was simply beautiful, just beautiful. You read it so engagingly. I must read your book. Inner Beauty is so well described in your writing. Thank you so much. And Thank and you. another audience member, um, Natasha Middleton, says it was brilliant. So you have some admirers out there. Um, do we have any other questions that I might have missed? Um, we did have another person say that uh, they love the unique idea to channel the bishop from Victor Hugo and can't wait to read about the beauty of goodness. Where can we buy your book? It's available on Amazon in both the ebook and paperback forms. Mm -hmm. I also published through Ingram Spark. So the book is available through uh, really any bookstore almost worldwide. Oh. And uh, just, I, the wonderful me, I picked the worst time in history to publish a book. <laughs> yeah. And all the bookstores are closed. But, uh, if we ever surface again, it'll be available broadly through bookstores, and certainly it's always, even now at this moment, available on Amazon. Great, okay. I should also tell you that Sandy Hunt said it was perfection, uh, what you just well, read. 
And we just keep getting questions. Let's see. Um, let's see, I said that one. And yes, that, that was it. But it was just absolute perfection. So thank you so much, Alfred, for That's telling us all awesome. about it. Thanks yes. For letting me do it. Yes. And so again, if you, uh, you can also learn about his work on your website, correct? His website correct. is Alfred J. Garotto. It's spelled G-A-R-R-O-T-T-O. Alfred J. Garotto.com. And you can, of course, always reach out to us and we can, we can um, give you the information. All Thank right. You. So next we have William Martin of uh of arinda who is a writer of plays screenplays clinical reports and a roman aklef memoir he will be reading today an excerpt from his memoir my nana introduces me to my imagination and i just wanted to mention uh for everyone that it is available to listen correct william on wordplaypodcast.com it's an interview about about the book. Oh, it's an interview. Okay. Yeah. Greetings, everybody. I'm so grateful to be here. And just to set a little little nugget of context, this um, excerpt is from a recently published book called Life in an Ivory Tower, which is book one of a seven book series that takes all sorts of different puzzle pieces. The the arrival of my pioneer family in the Bay Area in 1853, um, my childhood growing up in Orinda, and my relationship with San Francisco, which I was dropped into during its wild and whimsical heyday in the 1970s. And I was, an, I was a very imaginative person. Um, in those 1970s days in San Francisco. And that is what this first book is about. Those, those times um, in the city's um, roller coaster playful history. And there's a moment in the book where since I am so imaginative, I flash back to my first experience with my imagination, which was a gift given to me by my grandmother. So I'm just gonna read you a little section from this book about that. My Nana introduces me to my imagination. It may not be the first memory I have of my Nana, but it is one of the first. My Nana didn't move around a lot out in the world for many reasons. Her friends were the people on her soap operas the secret storm, the edge of night, one life to live, and a handful more. She would watch one after another, despite my grandfather, who I called Bampu, occasionally shouting into the room that one was enough and that he had a mind to pull the plug on that television set. I watched them all with her. All those hundreds of hours at a very young age of people's problems and the picadillos they got themselves into might have had something to do with the fact that one of the hats I would wear when I grew up was that of psychotherapist. Now the deal between Nana and I walking through that forest of soap operas all day was at a point we came to a clearing an empty half hour. Nana would use that time to read to me. All children should be read to. It's very important. In this very first memory of my Nana, she is reading me a Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale, The Little Mermaid. The Disney movie has deep elements and a lot to recommend it, but the original fairy tale goes much deeper and darker and offers a warning. The Little Mermaid begins her life with a beautiful iridescent scaled tail. She is able to move fluidly in a land where she belongs. One day, she pokes her head out of the water and looks towards the shore at the land where human beings walk on two legs. She falls in love with the prince and is willing to sacrifice everything she is to get those two legs and to live in his world. 
It never occurs to her that she will be a fish out of water, never fit in, never belong. The Little Mermaid makes a pact with the sea witch to give up her birthright, her kingdom. In return, she receives two legs and a brief chance to live on dry land and get the prince to love her. How does it feel to exchange your tail for two legs? The Little Mermaid finds it tremendously painful to walk. She doesn't feel like herself and she doesn't feel comfortable in her own skin. The original Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale does not end well. Time runs out and the Little Mermaid doesn't win the prince and she has given up her authenticity and her throne in the underwater world to which she belonged. I could not have gotten a better warning about life at the starting gate than this fairy tale. I didn't take the warning. I have replayed this fairy tale and ended up giving up my shimmering tail and trying to walk on two spindly, painful legs in places where I don't belong more times than I care to recount. But all of that is an editorial side note. Here is what I want to remember and tell you. My grandmother's television set was a piece of furniture that had wooden doors very old school. And whenever we weren't watching TV, those doors had to be shut. In the early days of television, people were suspicious about opening up their living rooms and their lives to the presence of a television set and what came through it. When they figured that they could disguise the TV as a piece of furniture, they felt much more comfortable. So on this one day, in this half hour between soap operas, I got up from my grandmother's floral patterned couch and shut the doors on the television set and then sat back down and snuggled next to her and my Nana began to read to me the Hans Christian fairy tale of the Little Mermaid. I was listening to the sound of her voice and to the sound of her words and the meaning of the words when suddenly in my mind, I started to see the story. I got very scared. This had never happened to me before. My grandmother noticed my fright and asked me what was wrong. I told her that while she was reading, I was starting to see the story in my head. She gave me a beautiful little smile and then in her crackly, gravelly voice, she said to me, that is your imagination. You have just discovered your imagination. Just enjoy it and have a beautiful life with it. So I did. And I have ever since. Maybe a tad too much every now and then, but we will get into all that later. How wonderful to remember the exact moment when I became conscious of having an imagination. Yeah, that, that was wonderful. Thank wow. you. <laughs> I can't read to read the rest. Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, it's, a, it's an amazing anecdote and a moment of just like awakening and realizing your imagination. How does you, this memory of your grandmother, how does it weave in the broader scope of your memoir? Does it weave in and out? Does it come back? Um, I'm just curious. Are, do soap operas play a part as well in your uh, in the rest of your memoir? <laughs> well, it, it it depends on which book you're in. In the first book, um, the character is 19, and he fantasizes kind of like Secret Life of Walter Mitty. He he fantasizes constantly, and he's adding extra sauce of imagination to everything and everyone around him is trying to bring him down to earth to make all those career decisions and education decisions that that you're supposed to be making um, at that age so that's the way that imagination figures in that book um, the next book which is going to be coming out probably in about six weeks is about 
his childhood in Arenda. And one incident in that book, his imagination tells him he can fly and he jump, jumps off a wall and breaks his elbow. So there's just all sorts of, and then he, then he goes on to become a playwright and a film actor and a screenplay writer. So imagination pops in all the time. But excuse me, William, but was that incident actually true? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh my goodness. Well, we're happy you made it to, you know, our event today. <laughs> now, now, I did not tell them why my elbow was broken when they took me to the emergency room. I, I said I tripped. I, I, knew, I knew enough to, to know that I would make things much worse if I told them my imagination told me to jump. Oh my gosh, I love that story. That's so wonderful. So what then was it that influenced you to begin all of this writing, you know, of your memoirs and what influenced you to just motivate you to get going and start writing? I'm sure a lot of people out there have these stories in their background and they're like, you know, so affected by it as you were with your imagination. What was it that really just got you going? Really, really concisely, um, I've spent my whole life trying to develop like a literary style and be a literary writer. Mm -hmm. And um, I reached a certain point where um, I went to this, this place in Berkeley called The Moth, which is a storyteller's kind of improv thing. And they also have a podcast and it's people who were storytellers rather than worrying about creating a literary style. And when I went and heard these people telling stories, it reminded me of how my great uncle used to tell me stories when I was a little kid. And then I suddenly remembered Tender is the Night by F. Scott Fitzgerald, where he was so worried about carrying on the 19th century literary tradition and his wife, Zelda, wrote Save Me the Waltz about the same material that he wrote Tender is the Night about. And her book, she's storytelling. She, she's not worried about carrying on any literary tradition. And so her voice comes out. And it's, it's visceral, it's sensual, it's, it's authentic. And, and so that's what once I, I stopped worrying about being a writer and decided I wanted to be a storyteller, I finally found a narrative voice to write with. Does that make any sense? Yes, it does. And actually, it's wonderful advice to give to people. You know, I know I have a lot of friends that are, that are like, they could be, because they have so many great stories, they could be wonderful writers, but they just don't do it because they're worried. They're worried of what would people think or will I write good enough and all of that. So just tell your story, right? Just be a storyteller. It's great advice. Yes. Good, well, thank you so much for being here today. And again, I wanna remind everyone, if you have any other questions, oh, I'm sorry, we did have a, a comment from Linda Hartman who wrote nicely written, um, nicely written and read piece for, of your memoir about realizing your imagination. And also Sandy Hunt wrote, I can relate to his experiences. See, people can relate. Thank you so much for your story, she writes. So again, Thank you, Linda and Sandy. I appreciate that. All right. Awesome. Thank you, William. All right. Thank it's you. our pleasure to have now with us our next artist, or I should say artist and photographer, um, Grant Rusk of Moraga, who is here, whose photography reflects his locale, investigating familiar places and his surroundings. His approach has been to consistently survey places from critical and social points of view. Grant's work is included in the collections of SF MoMA and the Bancroft Library at UC Berkeley, among many others. Uh, he has been an instructor as well at the Harvey Milk Photography Center since 2011. The Lombard Arts Council also acknowledges and thanks you, Grant, for being a member of the Moraga Art in Public Spaces Committee. And uh, now, Grant, maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, a little bit about your photographs that you'll be showing today, and, and anything more you'd like to add. Thank you. 
Oh, thank you. Hello, it's nice to be a participant today. Um, if we could have the first slide up. Um, uh, yes, it's true. Um, my work largely reflects uh, my locale, uh, familiar places and surroundings. I'm also very interested in um, investigation of commonplace items. Um, I think we're always uh, taking for granted now the, uh, the three-dimensionality of uh, photo phot uh, photography um, placed on a flat surface. Um, what I've been trying to achieve uh, recently with this work is a is a trying to flattening the picture plane um, to bring the image uh, closer to the surface of the page. What I'm trying to do is uh, employing uh, things like um, a very shallow depth of field, uh, selected focus, uh, flash very often, and very often I use a fence or a screen that's really right up against the, uh, the surface of the, of the print. There's also a great deal of attention to color. Color is not just a given in these pictures. Uh, color um, is, uh, is employed as a form. Uh, the sky is not just an empty sky, it is a, is a wedge of color in this picture. Can we do a second, second picture, please? Um, <clears throat> This is a, a very formalist approach to picture making. Um, it's a tightly organized compositional structure uh, where it's important for the edges and the corners to be uh, equally important to the body of the picture. Very good, that's fascinating. And the, uh, the third one, please. Um, for me, uh, making a photograph is, uh, is an analytical process. Uh, let's say compared to painting. Uh, with painting, you're, you have a blank canvas and any marks you make uh, on the canvas uh, make it more complex. With photography, uh, you start with the entire world, the, the entire multitudinous images in the world, and um, you decide what you want to photograph. And what you put in the, in the frame uh, organizes and uh, simplifies the world. This uh, last uh, picture is, um, it's Edward Weston's Pepper, number 30, and it was made in 1930. Um, I use it uh, in my class because uh, one is a, it's a classic piece of modernist photography. Um, it, uh, it shows how an artist using photography uh, with its great deal of detail and vast uh, tonal range can, um, can uh, elevate a, a common object to a much higher level. So that uh, at this point, we're not really looking at a pepper anymore. We're looking at a picture of a pepper. Edward Weston was also very influential in, uh, as a modernist to um, make sure that we knew that uh, he was, he was uh, showing his authorship. In other words, he wanted to make sure that uh, you knew that he took this picture and that uh, actually no one else could have taken this picture. That's fascinating. How you say that this was an influence for you as a photographer. I'm wondering if you can elaborate a little bit more on that. Um, the, uh, the, the choosing and uh, photographing of common objects is a great part of uh, modernism, uh, whether it is in painting or even music sometimes. Uh, it's an influence for me because it could show, it show Edward Weston showed um, us what a photograph could be as an art, as an art object. I see. We have uh, some comments for you, Grant, uh, from, the, uh, from the attendees out there. Mm -hmm. um, Omar, I just wanna tell you, Omar said that this guy is amazing. So there you go. 
uh, from Omar. Um, also uh, from Grant, the, or, or sorry, uh, these are fantastic photographs, he says. Um, an, another person um, says, your comments about the objects organizing the photo is interesting. Did you find the objects in the first three as they were? Yes, uh, there is, a, the, they are shot with a digital camera, but uh, there is, um, uh, it, um, what you do is you, you set up um, limitations for yourself. And with, with the digital photography, uh, there is a lot that you can do. There is a certain amount of post-production that I do, but basically uh, what you see uh, is pretty much what I saw. Mm -hmm. And uh, I photographed it that way. Um, you can, there is the, you know, the sky's the limit when you're making any sort of photograph. And, um, and I think the, um, you set up a kind of a, a moral limitation to your work as to how far you can take it. Um, and uh, with a, a, just a, a limited amount of um, a contrast control or color or, or cropping a little bit, but basically that's the scene that's there. Mm -hmm. And when we, going back to that um, uh, Edward Weston photograph, um, he, he wanted people to, to realize that it was his photograph. How did you develop your own style over time? How did you, so that, so that when we look at a Grant Rusk photograph, uh, we know that it's yours and what, you, what drew you uh, to the elements that repeat in your work? This is a question actually asked by Elena, but I'm, I'm curious as well, like how did you evolve your sense of, of, of own style? Well, there's a lot of influences. I think that nobody, especially in photography, can uh, deny that uh, once you, if you're a teacher or you're a, a student of photography history, you're not going to be influenced by uh, some of the great photographers. And there may be uh, people that may see influences in my work of uh, other people. Um, but um, it probably started because I um, would never really worked as a commercial photographer. I went to uh, an art department, I went to university in an art department where um, the, uh, it w the photography was very new to art departments and universities. And uh, the emphasis was on uh, self-expression and working with photographs as, a, as an art medium. And um, I've always been influenced by other, other artists as well. Um, people like uh, Cy Twombly, Ed Ruscha, uh, those have always been very much influences. I, I study a lot of that work. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think it plays in maybe um, at a part of, of what I do. I see. Okay. We had another question um, from an attendee. For people first getting into photography, do you have any advice as to what to look for or what to capture or how to take a good photo? Um, the class that I teach at Harvey Milk is, um, is, is called uh, Developing Your Personal Vision. And I think um, uh, once you get the, the technical part of photography under your belt, um, I mean, let's face it, photography, especially now, is pretty easy. I mean, it doesn't really take much. Um, the, the emphasis would be to um, encourage, encourage the student or the person uh, asking uh, to develop their own personal vision. Um, try to avoid cliches. I think that if you don't have a, a thorough, huge art background, you may fall into uh, a little bit of a pit of thinking that uh, there's only maybe seven different categories that you can make photographs of. Uh, landscape, still life, uh, seashore, portraiture. Um, the, uh, the idea is to take some chances uh, rely on your own judgment and make photographs that you think you should make for yourself. Um, we, we, uh, we, we don't need another picture of the Golden Gate Bridge. <laughs> right, I understand. That's great advice. Um, we're getting lots of questions for you. Um, Lena White would like to know, can you speak to the social or political aspect of your photographs? It's something that you think about when you take your, your photographs. Uh, yes, basically it's surrounding, much of it is to do with environment, um, uh, architecture, what's happening now, 
mm -hmm. uh, the kinds of items. Uh, that's why I very much focus on um, the surroundings, things that I encounter, uh, things that, that deal with my own um, uh, surroundings, uh, and uh, how to place them in a, in a particular um, in a particular space. Uh, that's why I've been interested in flattening the surface of the photograph uh, recently to um, bring upon some of the areas that we actually live in and how they look and uh, perhaps um, uh, raise some issues about uh, where, where we are and what, what the place is that we live in looks like. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting, that's great. Um... Let's see, Giovanni Angulo says he agrees with Omar that you're amazing. So there you go. And um, also, I think Susan Gorell had also asked that the information of if you reshifted the objects in your photographs. So essentially, you're not necessarily trying to do that. You're trying to take it as they are, the, the imagery. Uh, yes, that's why I, I really didn't, um... Uh, specify anything uh, in detail of each piece because they all are related. I've been working in a very large series. These are just three pieces in a very large series that had to do with the same. Um, once if uh, three pieces are nice to see it together, if you saw maybe 20 of these, uh, they may start to uh, uh, click into something else that you might be uh, thinking about. Um, right, and I have another um comment here. Your photography is amazing. I would love to see more. This is from Linda Hartman. They are like a process, an opening. Can you speak more about the post-production that you do and the moral limitation that mean? That mean? Well, uh, what we have in terms of the history of photography, we've always been uh, able to manipulate the, 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 the print or the, the image. Um, we're dealing with picture making here. We're not dealing with reality. So the emphasis is really put on picture making. Uh, not, not, these are not documentary pictures. Um, but at the same time with all of the technology and the processes and invitations you have to do something with a photograph, uh, mm -hmm. the individual needs to set up limitations and needs to say how far one can go without uh, venturing into no man's land. Okay, great. All right, that's wonderful. I uh, wanna thank you again um, for being with us today, Grant. And if anyone would like any more information about Grant's uh, photographs that he did show today, you can reach out to us at lamerandarts.org. Um, but thank you again, thank you. Thank you. All right, and our next uh, uh, author is Lucinda Jackson of Walnut Creek. Um, she is a scientist and former business executive who spent most, almost 50 years at three universities and four Fortune 500 companies where she experienced and witnessed the unequal treatment of women. And this spurred her to write about how to change that dynamic and how to help women find their power in the workplace and in life with her, her book called Just a Girl, um, which is available on Amazon. But today, Lucinda will be reading from her upcoming Coming of Age for Grown Ups memoir called Beetlejuice. Uh, the audience, I just want to let you know again, if you have any questions, you can type it in the Q&A box below and we can ask her those questions when she's finished. So take it away, Lucinda. Thank you so much. Um, yes, yeah, so this is my first book, Just a Girl Growing Up Female and Ambitious. And as Denise said, it tells the story of my um, efforts to succeed in a male dominated world as a scientist. And I go back to the early um, 50s and give kind of a chronology of uh, women in science, as well as my own experiences. But today, this book um, is called Beetlejuice. And it's about what's happened, what happened after um, my, my big career in the corporate world. So I'm gonna read the uh, beginning part of this book. Seated in the open air pavilion for our swearing in ceremony, I wore my only dress, an old polyester polka dotted number from my early corporate days. Craig had on cheap slacks and a slightly weird colored green shirt on sale from big five sporting goods in the US. 
We both dangled old rubber sandals off our cross legs and sported big frizzy hair from the humidity, held slightly under control by our fresh flower traditional marmar crowns, mine purple, Craig's red. Craig said, the forecast is dreary with a chance of typhoon. Sweat drip dripped off his nose. My skin prickled as perspiration streamed down my back and my bare legs stuck to the scratched metal folding chair. But I sat tall, ramrod in my back and my chest puffed up. I knew my face glowed like a first time bride. My head danced with scenes of worthy service to others and an island romance with Craig as my innate optimism bubbled to the surface. I heard the command, please stand. I sneaked a quick look at Craig. His smile was small with a trace of skepticism and a bit of a smirk, a sharp contrast to the giant grin smeared across my face. Craig and I married almost 30 years ago, so I knew from experience his expression was a flashing red warning light. He might not be totally on board for this adventure, whereas I wanted him to love it so much that his positivity would allay my own doubts about dragging us all the way across the world to an unknown life. But his smirk didn't dampen my spirits. Craig and I rose, I adjusted my, my posture, my heart pinched a little, then opened, flooded with yearnings and righteousness. I gulped and my eyes misted as I declared with a quaver in my voice, I promise to serve alongside the people of Palau in Micronesia. I will embrace the mission of world peace and friendship for as long as I serve and beyond. I am a Peace Corps volunteer. Two months earlier, Craig shuffles along, pulling my, we're pushing my wheelchair towards the senior center. I'll just leave you here for the crochet class, he says, and parks me in the bleak side room off the small auditorium. The other old women stare as he kisses my cheek and bangs his way out the door. Hello, young lady, the middle-aged art teacher chuckles, full of fun. Let's get you started with some nice colorful yarn. You could make a dolly, a doily for that cute guy of yours. My head sags, my heart revs up. As the instructor hands me my supplies, I shove them aside. Fuzzed yellow and green strands of yarn fall to the brown linoleum floor. My hands grip the armrests of my wheelchair and I lean forward with a single huff, bolt out of the chair, sprint across the room, out the security door, and tear my way down the street, feet pounding on the pavement, gasping. I yell, no, no. Clammy sweat trickled from my armpits, wetting my pale pink linen shirt. I sat at my wide wooden desk with matching credenza and conference table in my corner office, visualizing my worst nightmare. If I ever broke from my corporate chains, I would be sure I didn't spend my liberation on craft projects at a senior community in Florida. I didn't even consider my parents' model of I want to retire, but rather ask myself, what's my next career? And the one after that? As I wiped under my arms with a tissue and collected myself, a primal scream in my head voiced, I will not end up calling out bingo. 40 years in corporate America had done a number on me. Daily, I stared at a packed schedule of meetings, negotiations, budgeting, and personnel problems. My shoulders were permanently hunched from the stress of the commute, the posturing, and the wrangling of executive life. I needed to get out. One way I'd seen others leave their careers was to have no plan. They'd say, I'm just going to figure it out. Grandpa had done exactly that. After he sold his engineering company, he woke up each morning put on his wool three-piece business suit and hat and sat staring out into space on my grandmother's brocade couch in the living room. Even at 10 years old, as I slid by him, it creeped me out. Could I leave with no plan? What would I do all day after having every second of my day scheduled? Would I drift, get depressed and turn into a potato? I wanted some structure, but not so much that I never had a minute to myself. A slower pace called to me, but another strategy I'd seen from colleagues was to have their post-exit plans so slow paced that it sent chills up my arms. I shivered to brush off the terror. We're downsizing to a condo with no stairs since we're not getting any younger. I pictured them in their downsized den with a deck of cards. 
We bought a little vacation home and planned to spend more time with the kids. There they were in, outside in a double porch swing next to their walkers, watching the grandchildren play. I'd like to take an elder friendly cruise, they'd say, arg. I saw people underestimating themselves, thinking they were too old for adventure and life in general. Where was the excitement, the freedom, the wind in your hair? Did leaving my career mean I was out of the loop, ancient and invisible, doomed to a rocking chair? Those leisurely approaches wouldn't work for me. My stomach tightened when I thought of not having a cause or a purpose. Was I just going to sit home, eat a bowl of chocolate chips and watch TV? Would I become a drain on society? And beyond all these concerns, I worried about my marriage. Craig and I were good partners, usually solving problems together, pinch hitting for each other. This transactional arrangement worked well for us during our hectic child raising years. Then when the kids grew up and moved out on their own, Craig and I both focused more than ever on our careers. I'd noticed, but didn't pause to think much about it, that we'd begun to live parallel lives. Since we are no longer trying to put dinner on the table for a family meal or convene for a family homework help night, spots of glue that held us together, we tended to go our own ways. If Craig and I left our fast moving lives, would unlimited free time be the death blow to our relationship that was working pretty well? Would we trip over each other, get sick of one another, drift further apart? Would too much togetherness be too much? Recently, I found a 1990s close up photo of Craig in our early marriage days. His big brown eyes with the long thick lashes looked directly at me with a softness and caring I hadn't seen in a long time. I swallowed hard, stuffing down a longing, some loss that I didn't even want to identify. Well, that part's over. No romance at this age, I thought. I guess our best years are behind us. Tears welled up and my chest caught with that tight grabbing feeling. I secretly took out that photo every now and then and stared at it with an emptiness that hurt deep in my heart. Thank you so much for listening. That was wonderful. Wow. That speaks to a lot of us, I'm sure. Uh, we're all wondering, <laughs> at least I am, what's my next career, you know, after working for so long. And so that was really fabulous. Um, I have a, a few questions for you. Um, and I'm guess, I guess I'm just curious, like, how did you go from being like, you know, in this retirement phase to, uh, you know, volunteering in, uh, in Palau? Uh, well, the book does explain that. I did analyze, um, as a you know, scientist, I did analyze a lot of different options. And I did a lot of exploring and reading and researching. And then I remembered the Peace Corps back from when I was 16 years old. And I thought, I wonder if that still even exists. And I looked it up and found that they took old people. And uh, so I, I signed up. And within two weeks after I left my uh, corporate job, uh, I was in Palau in uh, the Peace Corps with my husband, Craig, <laughs> who came with me. And how was, what was his uh, feelings about it when you first brought it up to him? Was he thrilled and excited for a new adventure? No. <laughs> and, and I do explain some of that in the book, um, that process and responsibility when you talk somebody into something. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, so it's, um, maybe I could explain a little bit the, the title of the book uh, called Be Beetlejuice, which uh, the beetle nut is a, is a beautiful um, berry, actually, that grows on these lovely 100 feet tall palm trees in the South Pacific and other places. And they have um, like fan life like leaves that sway in the wind and these big clumps of these nuts, the berries, actually. And so it has a beautiful image. Um, and a lot of people, um, you cut them open, they chew them and it creates juice, the beetle juice. And, uh, it, but the beetle juice has a, the dark side, which is that it causes um, oral cancer and it also causes your teeth to stain permanently red. And so it's a metaphor for these, you know, exploring something and we, this picture we had of going to a South Pacific Island and this idyllic life and how everything goes wrong, but how with dark comes new light <laughs> and right. uh, the transformation. I call this kind of a coming of age story for um, grownups. I see. Great. And there was something about the, the swearing in ceremony in Micronesia. Can you talk a little bit about that or do we, do you want us to read the book? <laughs> Can you just mention a little bit? <laughs> 
Um, it was, for me, it was really moving. Um, I'm, I, I'm a very idealistic person. I've been interested in the Peace Corps since I was a young girl and all through my life and never had a chance to check it out. So at 66, I, I joined the Peace Corps and um, I, I certainly found out right away there were pros and cons. And, uh, but, but the swearing in part, I really did love. I was ecstatic. It was like a dream come true. And uh, uh, not so much for my husband, but um, that's part of the story of how we kind of reconcile some of that. I see. That's very inspirational for all of us, the fact that you did that. Uh, we have a question here from Zana. Oh, Zana, I'm sorry. Tok Tok Tarbevkova. Oh, I probably butchered that, sorry. Um, Lucinda, how did you decide to start writing? So obviously you're in the corporate world and then you decided to go to the Peace Corps. What was your motivation? It just sort of started. Um, when I finally had some time after a really hectic career, I, I just started writing and I had a lot of thoughts and feelings in me and a lot of stuff I probably had stuffed down um, to fit into the corporate world. And so it just sort of started I started taking notes. I started just writing things down. And, and then I thought, well, maybe some of this could help other people. So a, a lot of what I do now, I have my own business, but I, I help um, women particularly um, learn how to, to operate in a male, in male dominated professions and help uh, corporations decide how to make a workplace more friendly to, to women. Um, so it, it wasn't really a decision. It just sort of happened. And I, I just really have enjoyed it. That's great, yeah. Uh, Linda also asked, and I think you might have answered this, how did you choose to go in the Peace Corps and was, tell us how it worked out as your new adventure. It sounds like um, you'd been thinking about it for a long time. Yeah, I won't, I won't spoil the story by telling okay. you how it turned out, but I can promise you it, there was a ton of adventures and a ton of left turns, right turns, and um, both personally and uh, emotionally with my uh, my relationship with my husband and um, professionally. It was, it was a real adventure. <laughs> Great. And we can find your book as well um, on amazon.com. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm on Barnes and Nobles and um, Powell's and any bookstore and uh, in libraries also. Great. Thank you so much, Lucinda. Thank you. Our artist today is coming, uh, is here with us. Her name is Laura, Lara, sorry, B. Harupian. She was born in Beirut and has lived in Arinda for over 15 years. Laura has exhibited all over the Bay Area, New York, and Providence, and will be seen um, in the La Mirinda Arts Council's Art Gallery at Wilder online exhibit. We've moved everything online, and we have, we're going to have a fabulous um, gallery page with all of Laura's uh, new work. And her theme for this event is Contemplation in Place, Laura, would you like to share some things about your work? Well, um, I always like to create atmospheric paintings, more peaceful, and to draw the viewer into the image and create some more internal um, feelings. Uh, so I chose a couple of pieces today to show you, especially the pieces that speaks to me the most. And I was very moved when I created those pieces. Um, and the light is a very important factor into my paintings and the texture as well. Uh, this piece actually, um, it's uh, very interesting because it has a lot of texture and it was painted on top of another painting. Uh, I always tend to do that. Uh, like I work on a piece and a year later I look at it and I don't like it and I say, okay, I think it's about time to change this painting. And this painting particularly probably has three layers on it. And sometimes I take photos of the past paintings and sometimes I don't. And this particular piece actually, it has a depth of the light and those arches. The arches, it's very important. At a very young age, I always tend to paint arches probably growing up in Middle East. So we tend to see those architecture. It's kind of so drawn to me. Um, and has the contrast of that electric blue pigment and that red that are just contrasting and it takes you in, into the image and you want to just go somewhere through those uh, lights and windows. Um, it's a little bit more spiritual piece to me 
in the same way. So we can go to the next one. Uh, this painting actually, it's, it's a very, it's a, it's a tribute. It's a dedicated to a dear friend that I lost beginning of this year. Uh, this was pre-COVID and my heart was really broken and in tears and in pieces. So I really wanted to create a painting to kind of uh, express my pain and my feelings. So, and it was just kind of a meditation when I did this piece. And I tend to, to little pieces and create into a big piece. If you see it, the panels are small little panels into a six. Um, and he's a very dear friend of mine that he's always in my, around me. So his name is Clem. So the painting is called Clem. And if you can see, there is a face behind a tree that it's always be there. And you look at it, sometimes it just kind of vanishes and sometimes it comes back to you. So as the artist, can I just ask you about this piece? Um, when, if someone purchases this, do you make that a recommendation to them about how to, um, you know, install that in their home? Like how would you um, do it tightly together or looser or, you know? Uh, yeah, I, I recommend together and maybe just leave a quarter inch. You can leave a quarter inch. But at the same time, I like the person to be kind of creative with their own. If you want to just even put it separate, you can easily put it separate too. And I tend to do look at it as each panel. You can use it as an each panel as well. So I like that question. Okay, just curious. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, so this, this particular piece actually, um, during the quarantine, I was working uh, long hours and I, and this painting was the largest canvas that I had in the studio. And I wanted to create a little special piece, more like a, something that is just as if I'm ending my quarantine. So I created this painting using uh, lots of different pigments. And those pigments actually, they were, um, they're from Peru. Uh, and my husband had given to me years ago and I was wanted to keep it for an special event. So it happened that I used it and then my daughter came up with this idea. And actually, if you notice, there's a hand in the painting, but that's actually the photo we created that. Um, actually the painting, it's only the painting itself. So you don't see the hand. I see. Uh, uh, my daughter, she's 13 years old, Patil. Uh, she goes to OIS and she started painting her hand in the studio and said, mom, look at this. And it was her idea. So we start taking photos, different angles with her playing with the moon <laughs> in her hand. Uh, yeah. So, um, that's wonderful. Great. <laughs> Is there another piece or those were the three? No, those are the three pieces. Okay. And also this particular piece, uh, my friend, um, my dear friend, a pianist, her name is Sharon Kim. Her and I, we made a video together. Uh, it's a very special video, her playing the music and this painting itself. Right. I was uh, going to ask you about that. So she actually composed the music. Is that correct? No, she, I mean, she played the music. Oh, I see. Uh, yeah. And uh, she did ask me, uh, what kind of music do you want me to play? I mean, just pick something. Let's do some work together. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of inspirational work her and I, we did. Um, she's a very special friend of mine. And we have this artistic level to discuss together about art and music. And it was really um, a fun project doing together. And yeah, absolutely. Collaborations um, are always so magical when you do them with artists and even other kinds of artists, like so musicians and art artists. Um, I understand your daughter collaborated with you. Is this piece then the one she collaborated with or did she actually put paint on canvas with you? Uh, no, actually. She only did her own hands. She painted her hand and we just took a photo. Not with the painting itself, yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay, good. Uh, I have a, a little comment from Elena who says, so you must love Debussy to choose Claire de la, 
Claire de Lune, Claire Lavin. Yes, exactly. Actually, I was listening to the, that music particularly, and it was just whole in that mood. It is so uplifting and has an amazing positive uh, dimension that just it gives you good feelings. And also, Laura, you run the Laura Atelier. I love the name. Um, yes. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is? Yeah, so when I moved here uh, and my kids always wanted to paint and at a very young age, I loved working with kids and teaching art. So I kind of came up with the idea of creating a little studio, art studio here in my own uh, studio here in Orinda. And uh, I've been doing this for last seven years. I have kids around you know, I have some students that they started with me from elementary and they graduated now. Uh, so it's just wonderful to see a local kids uh, doing art and learning and expressing their emotions with the creativity. Mm -hmm. So, well, it's so. wonderful that you are there to inspire them and to help them find their way in, in the art world. Um, I want to, again, Remind everyone to please come to our website, lamarindaarts.org. Look in our galleries uh, starting in September and you will see Lara's work. It's, it's stunning. And all of the work that you'll be putting up will be from this time period, right? It's, it's all yes. new work from the you know, shelter in place period. Exactly. Okay. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, let me see. Oh, we might have one more question here. Um, Okay, no, I, I think we've got everything. So thank you again, Laura, and thank you for being with us today. Oh, also, yes, somebody did ask about the video, who said they would like to see the video. Uh, we can't run it right now, but we do have on our website, um, when we have Laura's information up, it will have links to actually two videos that you produced, um, one with your friend and then another one, and you'll be able to see a lot of her art in those videos. So definitely come to the website and check that out. All right, and you're welcome, Sarah. Um, okay, and next up, we have our final author, who is Michelle Hoffman of Arinda. Um, she is a master coach in life and business. In her first book, Life Worth Living, she specializes in helping widows and soul parents reestablish their lives after loss to live a full and happy life. Michelle will read from her new book, The New Management Blueprint, Spark Talent to Ignite Winning Teams and Create Valuable Results. And here is Michelle. Thank you so much, Denise. And thank you to the La Miranda Arts Council for finding the intersection between art and words. Because of course, as we were speaking earlier, collaborating in the way that we perceive life and art um, is the way that we live. And that's really how I've chosen to write books, this being my second book, bridging the gap between personal and professional life and going from being an individual contributor in an organization or as a leader of any kind to becoming a leader of other people and how to then transfer that inspiration to be a leader to help then catapult, find the value and promote other people to, um, to see all that they can become. So what I'm sharing with you today is actually the opening of the new management blueprint, which I wrote as this pandemic fell upon us. And the intro really is inviting the reader, the audience, the listener to understand and demonstrate that I know where you're at and where you're coming from. So with that, I will share with you the opening to the new management blueprint. Creating value in the opportunities change creates, chapter one. It was a Friday afternoon when Amanda received a phone call from her manager's boss, Melinda. Amanda could barely breathe. She knew this woman only because Melinda spoke at big company meetings and Amanda had seen her in the office, typically very occupied in deep conversation or looking at reports as she was walking through the halls. Why wouldn't Amanda be speaking with her own manager? Would her manager be with her in this meeting? Was she in trouble? She had not done anything out of line. 
Amanda straightened the papers on her workstation, touched the mouse on her desk, and woke up the screensaver on her computer, showing her golden dog playing in the water at her parents' lake house last summer. She smelled the morning's cold coffee in her cup and took a big gulp, hoping it would bring her some courage to face whatever she was about to face. She wondered if her colleagues could see what was going on with her. Could they hear her heart racing? One of her team members asked her a question about a document that she was trying to access, and Amanda stopped to direct her where in the shared file she would find it. Amanda walked past her manager's office. It was empty. Amanda had brought reports to Melinda's office before, so she knew to take the elevator up to the third floor and go left past the marketing team's offices. Amanda stopped to connect with Melinda's assistant, who looked a little peaked, yet maintained quite a professional appearance as she escorted Amanda into the large, handsomely decorated corner office filled with awards, certifications, and trophies, and pictures of Melinda's wedding and a family picture during a Whitewater River rafting trip. Congratulations, Amanda. We'd like to offer you a promotion to management. You'll be leading other people now. Amanda left that meeting with mixed feelings. She was walking on air with a knot in her stomach. She was honored and so excited because she was given exactly the promotion she had hoped for, but not exactly how she hoped it would go. Evidently, there had been layoffs and her manager was one of the employees laid off. Amanda was promoted to managing the four people on her team who until this moment had been her peers. Now she reported directly to Melinda and would participate in the manager's meetings once a week in the large conference room upstairs. Melinda provided her with high level insight that made Amanda wonder if she was prepared for this responsibility. The layoffs were a result of the company not making revenue goals. They were making an effort to reduce expenses. Amanda was told she would need to do more with less. Like the rest of the company, she had been brave enough to ask Melinda what that meant. Her instructions were to streamline processes. She would need to increase revenue by increasing the volume of, si of the size of sales and reduce expenses to increase the profit margin. Melinda added she was concerned about high employee turnover of people leaving to larger salaries and competitive jobs because it's expensive to recruit, hire, and train new employees. Amanda thought she had a clear understanding of the company's goal. She was glad she was not laid off like her manager. Now that she was a manager, she was worried if she was up for the job. She wondered if she had the skills and really understood what was expected of her. She was too intimidated by Melinda to ask for more details about how she would be doing all the things that were just asked of her. And she no longer had her manager to ask questions for clarification. Amanda wondered if she should have gone to business school to take on this job. Melinda said she was welcome to come to her with questions, but Amanda knew Melinda was really too busy to be available for this level of questioning. Melinda must have seen the fearful look on Amanda's face as her parting words were, learn from your peers. And then Melinda's body language totally changed. She ended the conversation abruptly by picking up the phone to start another conversation and returning to work on her computer. Feeling as if an invisible wall had just separated her from Melinda, Amanda understood that the conversation had ended. She paused for an uncomfortable moment, opened her mouth to ask a question and realized it would fall on deaf ears. So she got up and left Melinda's office. As she walked out, Melinda gruffly asked her not to say anything until they made a company-wide announcement at the end of the day, at which time all the changes would be made public. And oh, Melinda added, congratulations on your promotion. Welcome to management. Amanda returned to her desk with her neatly arranged papers, her cold coffee, and her adorable dog screensaver. She tried not to make eye contact with anyone because she hadn't figured out how she was feeling about all the changes that had just occurred. Instead of being excited about a management promotion, Amanda felt fearful. 
She was afraid of failing because she had never managed people before. And she was worried she wouldn't be able to get the results she needed to excel in the role. She was certain her group would be watching her every move, looking for a reason to find flaws in her performance. How would she figure out her exact role as a manager in this organization, given the current circumstances? Suddenly, she questioned if she was management material. How would she figure out her leadership style and would it be effective in this situation? She was getting anxious. Would she be able and capable of getting the result the organization needed to prevent further loss? Who would she go to for advice and mentorship? How would she gain the respect of her direct peers and reports? Would she know the right thing to do and when to do it to prove she was worthy of the role by adding the value the company needed to make the difference. Will she have to give up everything else in her life to focus on her career? Amanda's head was spinning. At 3 p.m., there was an all company meeting called. Everyone stood in the main conference room. Amanda felt her heart beating and her palms began to sweat as Melinda announced a few promotions, including Amanda's. When her name was announced, it felt like laser beams were going through her. She thought it would be enthralling to be promoted to management, but she stood petrified. She gulped and had to remind herself to breathe. She took a breath as calmly as she could through her nose so as not to appear as if she was about to gasp and run for her life. She looked at her old friends who were now her direct reports. They looked at her with surprise, wonderment, jealousy, disdain, and acceptance. She looked at other managers in the organization who nodded approval. She took another breath and looked for the others who had also received promotions and she felt part of an elite team. They mouthed congratulations and welcome. Her exuberance was cut short. Melinda continued to explain that 10% of the company had been laid off. Everyone scanned the room to see who was missing. Melinda continued, the company was relying on each employee to step up to make sure they met revenue goals to prevent further losses. The company, she knew, was doing the best it could. But in addition, the majority of the workforce would be deployed to work from home. Each person would be contacted by an HR representative to guide them through the process and connect them with someone in IT who would then help them get set up to work securely from home starting Monday. Amanda was stunned. Everyone was stunned. This opened up a whole new line of questions. How could she manage a team remotely? She wouldn't even be in the same office as them. She would have to figure out a way to reinforce what needed to be accomplished by when to maintain the momentum on her team, despite the distractions she and her teammates would experience with roommates, spouses, kids, or pets in their homes. She was worried about her presentation skills and, ab and ability to facilitate meetings in person. It would be even more challenging to conduct meetings remotely. She questioned if she could figure out how to be herself and lead a team? Would she be able to handle employee conflicts without saying the wrong thing? How would she know what to do? Who would she ask for help? Amanda's grandfather used to say, extraordinary times call for extraordinary leaders. Amanda was excited to be a leader as a manager. She was ready to figure out how she will become the manager who truly makes the difference. She realized she needed a blueprint of what she was building. To discover how Amanda and you, if you're in a leadership role, can create value in the opportunities change creates, you're welcome to a gifted copy of my best-selling book, The New Management Blueprint. And all you need to do that is go to newmanagementblueprint.com and you can download a copy to find out how Amanda handled the situation and how businesses today are working cohesively and successfully to build all of the revenue momentum and make the goals even during a pandemic and working from home. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle.
That was interesting. That was good. Um, I wanted to ask you, the intro to your book sets a scenario of a woman getting promoted uh, to management. And this can be a really scary um, thing for a first-time manager. And I haven't uh, downloaded your book yet, um, but I wanted to see if you could elaborate a little bit on how this opening relates to the rest of the topics throughout the book. Uh, do you do them in story form? Or do you, you know, how is that? How does that work out? Absolutely. Thank you for that, Denise. Um, in fact, this is the, um, the book was written because people who have reported to me have moved into management roles, either I promoted them into management roles, or they've been promoted to management opportunities. And they've looked to me as a mentor and as a guide to all of the things that I teach in the book. Some of them are storytelling, and a lot of it is really... Um, a way for you to lead, to lean into who you truly are and find out where your strengths are and then stretch your strengths. And as hard as it is, trust me to help you identify where your weaknesses are and then strengthen those weaknesses. And one of my favorite um, lessons that I teach is just like organizations have a board of directors, you too can have an advisory board. You don't have to be the expert on all things. However, you can find expertise at your fingertips wherever you need it. So the book, the whole book is all about leaning into who you are as a manager, what kind of leadership style is going to work in a specific circumstance, how to avoid imposter syndrome and ensure that you actually have what it takes to do the job. Do you understand what the job is so that you can focus and make the right decisions at the right time and do the right thing right, which I would call diplomacy. Um, I've been invi invited into organizations to help their managers align all of the efforts and strengths and values that the employees under the manager's um, report are all in alignment, making success inevitable. Mm -hmm. And I've done that in my professional career and that's why I'm now opening up this book as an opportunity to invite me into an organization to do the same. I see. And would you say that this book is geared then mostly towards women or it could be broad spectrum, men and women? I am very inclusive in the way that I work with people and employees. And it's really very specifically designed to an organization that is open to being inclusive and to understand that we are the value, the skills, the, um, the, the, the talent that we bring to the table. It's open, it's open to the right skill and the right position. I see. Great. Um, and did you self-publish or did you go through a distributor, a publisher? How did, you, how did it work out for you as a writer? So I never anticipated myself as a writer of this kind. I always wrote professionally for the organizations and for clients that we had. Um, my first book, Life Worth Living, what I wrote as a love letter to um, to a woman who had gone through a very similar life change as I did. And once I had figured it out, I realized there was literally no guide to how to pull your life together after a major transition, changing companies, changing communities, um, inviting a partner into your life, letting go of a partner from your life, inviting children, freeing them up, springboarding them. All of these things are major life events. Uh, the pandemic has caused all of us to have major life changes. And when those happen, there are literally seven things to address personally yeah. to make sure that you're stabilized and moving forward. So I wrote my first book. It was picked up by a publisher after I posted it on Amazon. Oh. So that one's now I've got a, you've got the ebook, a print book, and an audio book that are available Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Powell, all the indie bookstores. And the new management blueprint is available in ebook or in print copy on amazon.com. And I would be open to my publisher picking it up. But at this time, I've done it on my own. And that is, that is how the world is working 
in this day and age. You can totally do it on your own. That's great advice. Thank you so much, Michelle. And this concludes our event today. Um, and again, if anyone um, would like more information on our writers and our artists, uh, artists here, please reach out to us at lamarindaarts.org. Um, if you have any comments or feedback, we would also love to hear that. Um, and please uh, consider making a donation to La Miranda Arts Council so that we can continue to make these worthwhile programs for our community. Um, thank you again to all the authors here and all the artists here who are with us today. Um, and thank you to the attendees who watched uh, the La Miranda Arts Council's Art Embraces Words. Thank you and have a great evening. <laughs>